Okay, welcome back everyone to the afternoon session. So, the theme of this session is rock and mineral magnetism plus whatever the hell Connell is talking about. <laughs> um, and our first uh, speaker is uh, Liz Nagy from uh, Liverpool. Chelsea Dale's insights from micromagnetic modeling of thermite uh, recording in non uniform magnetic structures. Over to you, Liz. Okay, thanks for that, Richard. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to talk about um, thermal behavior of um, pseudo single domain grids, essentially. Uh, that's what this uh, incredibly long title actually means. Um, so, so just to begin with, uh, what are rocks? Uh, from my perspective, <laughs> <laughs> from my perspective, um, a rock is an assemblage of magnetic grains and stuff. And I'm not really interested in the stuff. I'm just interested in the magnetic grains and how those magnetic grains uh, behave um, as you heat them up and put them in a magnetic field. So these are not rocks. Um, what these are are um, ferrites. So this is uh, work by uh, David Krasser. And uh, he used electron lithography to create these very beautiful, um, small, uh, uniform assemblages of uh, single domain particles. And that's really the problem with the way that we look at grains and rocks and how they uh, record information. We think of them as small, uh, uniformly magnetized grains, and that's really not uh, a true picture of what they are. Um, so rocks really look like this. And uh, so these are some um, SEM uh, sort of fib slice and view images. Uh, the one on the, the left there is uh, from work by uh, Alison Cowan at Imperial. And the one on the right there is uh, the work by Evan Mikolaisen. And um, Really, you can see that the um, that the assemblages that we deal with have uh, an incredible range of sizes and geometries, and these are definitely not going to be single domain grains. Um, so, what we can do is we can go a long way to modelling uh, these incredibly complicated assemblages. Um, by simplifying the geometries that are available to us and maybe getting some idea of the kind of domain states that are available to us um, in our brains. So um, in a recent study, we've just published this um, last year, um, we looked at um, one specific uh, grain, a magnetite grain, and um, it was really chosen because it was quite a pathological example of the different types of domain structures that it can um, that it can support, and um, the types of domain state transitions that can arise from that grain. So, how do we go from um, magnetization structures to thermal remnants? So, we take a grain. And we essentially give it a random initial magnetization. We uh, do a calculation using micromagnetics. So we use a tool called Merrill. And we get a thing called an LEM state. And by using those LEM states, we can calculate the energy transition from state to state. And if we know what the energy barrier transition is between each state, we can begin to try and understand how those grains are going to record information and more importantly how they're going to behave when we try to recover that information so in our model um, we discovered um, that the geometry that we had supported um, one two three six uh, possible domain states so i've got three of them here uh, one long that's a and two short that are kind of at 90 degrees orthogonal to each other. And then there are the other two short ones, and then another long one, which is anti-parallel to A. 
And what we can do is we can then look at the energy barrier transitions between all of those uh, different uh, energy states, and we can build um, a statistical model of how they transition from state to state. And because we know uh, what all those different um, LEM states are as a function of temperature, we can start to build thermal models um, based on the variation of temperature in time. So we can look at things like cooling rates and we can look at things like, um, actually what you see here is very complicated laboratory protocols as we heat them, as we cool them in a field and out of, out of field. And so in our grain, and this is really the important part, um, these energy barriers, um, they're shown in this phase diagram. So um, what you're seeing here is, um, what you're seeing here um, is in the uh, yellow region. So that's for a temperature above around 240 C. Um, the only really stable state that uh, is available to us um, on a normal time scale. So, so what I've tried to do here is I tried to put the relaxation times on the uh, y-axis and they're taken from the energy barriers. And that's just based on the Arrhenius equation. And on the bottom, I've got a uh, temperature. And you can see how the uh, stability of the grain is given by the height of each of these graphs. And um, Yes, so in the yellow region, it gets quite complicated. So in the yellow region, um, the only stable state is the blue um, because it's, um, it has a kind of relaxation state that's um, above about an hour, even for high temperatures. All of the other states um, are much uh, lower. Uh, so these are the energy barrier transitions. Um, the other end of the temperature scale, so that's the green region between room temperature and about 130, so that's this region here. Um, the domain states are stable and all of them are stable. They are all stable at both um, quite high um, relaxation times. Um, and the barriers are really so high that they don't change. Um, and then we have this blue region in the middle. And this is a critical region. And uh, what's important about this region is that the speed or the cooling rate at which you pass through this blue region determines how and what your uh, grain is going to record. So we can look at uh, two possible examples of uh, cooling. And from those coolings and by reconstructing those temperature transitions, uh, we can actually reconstruct um, or we can build um, RI plots or simulate an RI plot. Uh, these RI plots are simulated from that one grain. So it's only one grain, keep that in mind. Um, but they're all randomly oriented. So it's a random orientation of a monodispersion. And the NRMs um, in this example are required over 18 years. And the laboratory cooling rate here is 40 uh, minutes. So we heat them up linearly. We get to the baking temperature and then we cool them down um, according to Newtonian cooling for 40 minutes. And so this, uh, this uh, slow cooling it, um, results uh, predominantly in domains aligned with the uh, short grain axis. And, uh, but the fast laboratory remagnetization, so remember we're cooling it slowly, but we're remagnetizing it quickly. And uh, what that means is that the domain states uh, will then realign to the long axis upon reheating in the laboratory. Um, a large difference in the remagnetization uh, occupancy of states results in these very large Peter and check failures. And you can see these, these red triangles here. 
And um, what you have to realize is that the PTRM failures, these are intrinsic to the uh, domain state transition. They're not coming from any kind of chemical alteration. It's just from the pure magnetic behavior of the grain. And we also include uh, PTRM checks here. So these are in these, are these green arrows here. Um, and these are actually quite large. And they're also indicating that there's some kind of reciprocity failure going on in the model. So if we look at the uh, NRM cooling rate of something that's much quicker, so much faster cooling time period. So this is over about a two hour uh, cooling period. Um, so this is the acquisition of the original NRM, by the way. So we're going from uh, curie temperature to room temperature over two, um, over two hours. You can see now that the sample um, for this very quick cooling rate is gonna pass the PTRM checks, but the PTRM chair tail checks here, they still fail. And the blocking temperature reciprocity failure, which is indicated by the, um, the tail check at 175, this guy here, um, this is contributing to the curvature of the RI plot. And um, really both RI plots, they exhibit some very strange features. And so one of them is this high temperature hook feature here. And um, I can also show you that here, yeah, in green. Um, and I highlight the cause of that in yellow at the side. So the reason why this, this happens, this hook happens, is because the PTRM gained between 200 and 300 degrees centigrade um, and the decrease in the higher temperature PTRMs, which is this yellow region, um, that's going to cause um, the, the hook to appear. So, um, so if we move to um, a comparison with uh, experimental data, um, so this is some data that we, um, sorry, that Brendan uh, acquired um, from Hawaii. And he also sees this uh, high temperature uh, feature. And really, um, it's just one example. It's just one experimental example um, of a possible um, uh, high temperature hook. There's many explanations, for example, could be chemically altering. Um, but these um, are fine grained basalts uh, in this sample, uh, if I'm correct. And um, they do consist of PSD grains. And so our theory are, is consistent actually with these observations. Um, so really in conclusion, um, we can build thermomagnetic models of um, paleo intensity of PSD grains uh, from micromagnetic calculations from the ground up. The models do reproduce uh, some of the common failures that we see in our experiments. Um, so these are things like failure of reciprocity, PTRM check failure, PTRM tail <coughs> failure. Um, and all of those effects, uh, they occur when the domain states with different magnetizations, but uh, similar energy barriers uh, can occupy the same brain. So fundamentally, what's happening is that you've got lots of different domain states. They're transitioning into other domain states. And the speed with which you cool through critical regions is the thing that's governing the behavior of the recording and not only the recording, but also the possibility of playing back that recording and acquiring the original NRM. Uh, so that's everything, thanks. Scary stuff. Um, <laughs> thanks, Liz. Uh, do you have any uh, questions here or on the line? 
Yeah, so the people online can see. Hello, everyone online. <laughs> uh, might be a little, a little bit hurt from what you're trying to yeah. this here, but if that um, natural sample did contain, let's say, any type of sulfides, for example, which, oh. <laughs> which most of our many of them do, what would you predict your graph would look like? Um, or is that like I don't know. Sample? Is the answer. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, we can model the sulfite, but that's actually a, an ongoing piece of work. So what we're trying to do next is we, this is one grain and it behaves weirdly, but it can reproduce lots of things that you see in the laboratory. That's the crazy thing about it. And it's not chemically altering. The next thing to do is to build assemblages. And then the next thing after that is to build compositions of different minerals. Yeah. Yes. Um, in principle, you can um, you can model anything. Um, the problem is that the more irregular and stranger your grains, the more domain structures you're going to have available to you. And the more domain structures you have available to you, they all correspond with different remnants. And what you end up getting is a combinatorial explosion of energy barrier transitions. So the idea with this work is we can simplify what we're seeing in the laboratory using models with much more regular geometries. That's one thing. The other thing is, if you're looking at energy barrier transitions in irregular grains, what tends to happen is that your, um, the procedure that calculates the energy barrier um, isn't really optimized for them, so it can explode. I think you found this as well, Richard, when you were doing it. It, it's, it uses heuristic to try and find the energy, the least energy path through very complex space. And um, it's extremely difficult to get that to work. I think we have a question from me online. Will? Yes, thanks. It's more of a comment really. Uh, just that, um, uh, well, first of all, somebody mentioned, uh, I think, iron sulfide. So uh, I, I think we, we can have a kind of a clue what might happen, say, if you had pyrotide, for instance, uh, because pyrotide is so anisotropic, such a high anisotropy, yeah. that it's likely to have um, kind of fewer domain states available. And the essence of the work that Les has done here, I, to my mind anyway, is that um, these effects occur in states where you have multiple possible um, uh, paths between different energy states, different domain states. And so you need competing anisotropies or competition between crystalline shape anisotropy or triaxial grains. All these will kind of result in the behavior that, that Les has outlined. Uh, so in, um, you know, I, I don't, we, we've talked as a, as a group, Les and, and um, Greg and, and, and myself about the range of possible types of grain morphologies and, and mineralities and different states that might result in this behavior. And um, we will detail that over the next few years. But I think these kind of processes where you have multiple different transitions result in multiple blocking temperatures per grain multiple coercivities per grain. And so even the correspondence between coercivities and blocking temperatures may be a, a, a tricky thing to do if you're looking at pseudo pin intensities. Anyway, yeah, a lot of really interesting stuff. Really I think it's this, uh, uh, you know, I'm bothered myself, but I think it's, it's great stuff. So well done, Les. <laughs>